So our abilities to predict the future are uh, limited, as we know, but I feel very confident predicting you will enjoy our second speaker as well. <laughs> the great mathematician David Hilbert once was invited to deliver the keynote address at a very large engineering convention. And uh, having been apprised of Professor Hilbert's history of making jokes about their profession, uh, the nervous engineers who were organizing his visit uh, decided to see him in advance to seek some assurance that he would uh, behave himself. And after beating around the bush for a while, they eventually came around to expressing their concern that he might cause offense. And at that point, he said to them, you have nothing to worry about. How could I possibly offend anyone? Mathematics and engineering have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> now, with all due respect to Mr. Hilbert, I think our next speaker would gently but forcefully disagree. In fact, Robert Greist has focused his innovating teaching and research on that intersection between mathematics and engineering. Specifically, he studies how to manage data in highly complex, highly distributed environments. In mathematics, it's called algebraic topology and geometric group theory. As Professor Greist has shown, these fields are particularly well suited to a variety of engineering challenges. In robotics, for example, large sensors and microprocessors will increasingly be replaced with many smaller sensors performing specialized functions. So the information that will be gathered locally will need to be integrated quickly and correctly into a larger picture of the macro environment. And it turns out there are just a few equations involved. Professor Grice gives another example, the robotic brain surgeon. And he asks, what would you rather have, a computer simulation or a theorem that guarantees success? And his answer is simple. You would like to have both. At Penn, he is Andrea Mitchell University Professor with appointments in the Department of Mathematics in the School of Arts and Sciences and uh, in the Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering in our School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Professor Rob Greist. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy and pleased to be able to speak to you today, but uh, I'm afraid I have a little bit of bad news, that being that this is a talk about mathematics. So uh, the good news is that there's, there's no test at the end of the talk, and uh, although you do have material for taking notes, I will not enforce that. The area of mathematics that I'm going to be talking about is an area where you know, taking notes doesn't, doesn't work so well. This is an area that, first of all, you've probably not heard of before, something called topology. And the reason why it's not going to work for taking notes so well is that it's an inherently visual topic. It's uh, somewhat related to geometry, but a little bit different as we're going to see. I do promise you this, there will be no equations in this talk. So rest easy, sit back and relax. Now, uh, topology, what is that? Well, hmm, uh, first of all, it is topology. Uh, some people get this confused with another subject with a similar name that has to do with maps. That is, of course, topography. This is not topography. Topology is a little bit different. Uh, topology has as its, uh, as its root word the word topos, which means place. So you might think of topology as the study of place. Now, notice I said place and not plates. The, the study of plates, small dishes full of delicious food, uh, comes from a, uh, a similar word, <laughs> but uh, that word is, uh, is Spanish, whereas the, the real root is topos, which is uh, Greek. So it's the study of place or location, and uh, what, you might, uh, what you might better call it is the, the study of abstract space. Now this definition as well introduces some complications because when I say it's the study of abstract space, I know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking outer space. And that's, that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about abstract space. So it's something that mm, in, the, in the limit, in the pure mathematical realm is, is really outside of the, the physical domain. But it is nonetheless the case that uh, thinking in terms of of abstract spaces is something that uh, might help 
I learned a lot about abstract space and outer space by means of this following ancient mathematician. Does anyone know who this mathematician is? This is, uh, this is not a mathematician. This is a poet. This is John Milton. What work did he write? Paradise Lost. Okay, so Milton, Paradise Lost. And uh, outer space and even abstract space figures into this work. If you remember how this story goes, the uh, perhaps hero of the story, Satan, the devil himself, is cast down into hell. And he, in his first problem, has to find a way to get to uh, this, this place that he has heard rumor of to tempt Adam and Eve. He says, uh, space may create uh, new worlds. And the use of the word space in Milton's Paradise Lost is the first example in the English language of space being used to mean outer space. And Milton had an interesting problem to solve in writing this book because he could not credibly put hell under the ground. We knew a little bit more about uh, geology at the time that he wrote that. And so what he had to do, what he had to do was locate hell in an abstract space that was outside of the physical universe. The way that Milton writes it in book two of Paradise Lost, the entire physical universe as we know it is, is a small ball connected by a golden chain to the Empyrean. And hell is separated by this vast gulf that he calls a void or, or chaos. And that's a really good example of an abstract space. It's something that's outside of the physical universe. You have to, you have to really get your head outside the world to visualize the, the way that Milton set things up. So uh, poetry uh, you know, can help us understand some things that are otherwise difficult to express compactly. Well, uh, let's see, if we want to uh, get at the study of abstract space, we should probably do some examples. So let's take a couple of minutes, uh, do some examples of some abstract spaces. The, the, the first and simplest one that I can think of is uh, a one-dimensional space that you could, uh, you could draw in your notebooks if you felt so inclined, very simply. It's just a line. And the way that most of us encounter this in mathematics early on is through the, the number line where we associate numbers to points on that line. And as you, as you go further, the, the numbers increase and they keep going and going. But let's change things up a little bit. Let's change the topology of this number line. Let's say that uh, as you're going, when you, when you finally get to nine, instead of going to 10 after that, you, you flip back and you go to zero. Uh, kind of like on an odometer after you've driven long enough, it, it flips over, everything gets reset to zero. Now, uh, this resulting space is no longer a line that keeps going forever and ever. Rather, it, it wraps around on itself, and it gives you something with a different, uh, different topology, a different abstract shape, one that we would naturally call circular. And the important point is that uh, to uh, the mathematician, you don't need the numbers there. You just need the shape. You just need the abstract space, and that's enough to, to get you going. And in fact, it doesn't need to be anything that you draw on paper as well. It doesn't have to be physical at all. We could take a, uh, a simple mechanical system that exhibits that same feature of executing uh, something that is uh, periodic or repeating, ruberos, the snake of history, or a, uh, a, a clock face with a hand that runs around, or a, uh, a, a robot arm in manufacturing context that has a revolute joint that goes around. Each of these separate systems that don't necessarily uh, look like each other have the same underlying abstract space, that of a circle. Uh, there's yet another example of uh, something that exhibits the same topology that uh, perhaps you've heard of. There's a dictum that was popular in uh, the computer manufacturing industry a while back. Let's see if you know this one. Fast, cheap, reliable, what comes next? Anyone ever heard this? Pick two, fast, cheap, reliable, pick two. That means uh, you can uh, get a computer as fast and cheap, but uh, you, know, you might not have it for all that long. So let's, let's take that, uh, that dictum, that aphorism, and think about it topologically. I could associate to each of these attributes some, uh, some point, and then uh, saying that we have the ability to manufacture something that exhibits two of those attributes would be like uh, connecting those points with a, with a line or with an arc. And the statement of this principle is that you can, uh, you can make pairwise connections 
and get something that, that looks like what you see on the screen, but you cannot fill in the hole in the middle. You, you can't build something that's fast and cheap and reliable that has everything that you want. So that abstract system of attributes and capabilities, again, has a, a space associated to it that is the same topology as that of a circle, even though I, I drew it with straight lines. It's still got that same underlying shape. All right, well, that's a, uh, that's a simple one-dimensional example. Let's move things up a little bit. Let's look at a, a two-dimensional example, and let's do so through that same very abstract lens of attributes. Let's, uh, let's do the same thing where we've got, uh, let's see, fast and cheap, but I'm gonna change things up again. Let's, uh, let's not do the computer industry. Let's do something that's a little bit different. Let's look at food, right? Tasty and healthy. And in this case, I've got four attributes and let's say for the sake of argument, you can only pick three. So you can have fast and cheap and tasty and you can fill in that triangular face. Back home, we call that a, a cheesesteak at the hot truck. I think here you call that in and out burger. Okay, so let's see. There are a couple of uh, other faces that you could fill in as well. If you want to get some of this fast and, and, and healthy and tasty, I think you've got that here in California, but you, you kind of have to pay for it. If you want something that is, uh, is cheap and tasty and healthy, well, I can get that for you, but you're going to have to come over to my house and I'm going to have to cook you a nice meal. It's going to take some time. And, you know, as far as that last face goes, you know, if you really want that, I, I think there's a rice cracker with your name on it. Okay, so uh, the fact that you can't get all four of those means that you've got these, uh, these surfaces, this boundary of this tetrahedron or this pyramid-like shape, and there's a, there's a hole in the middle of it. And so a, a mathematician would look at that abstract uh, a system of attributes and constraints and say, well, you know, that really has the, the topology of the, the surface of a, a, a ball, something that we would call a sphere, a two-dimensional object. Even though it lives in three-dimensional space, it's still got a, a surface that just has two degrees of freedom, two-dimensional. Okay, now we have to uh, uh, take a look at some other two-dimensional examples. The one, that, the one that I first learned about when I was young I was doing extensive research into topology, was uh, playing video games. Because uh, when I would fly the airplane off the right side of the TV screen, it would come back on the left side of the TV screen. And, and when I flew the airplane up the top of the TV screen, it would come back down on the bottom. That's a, that's a flat, two-dimensional space, but it has an interesting topology. Think of it, like we did with the line, of identifying the left and the right-hand sides of the screen. And so you get a, a cylinder. But I still have the top and the bottom of the screen. Those two, I would have to identify and glue together. When I did that, I would get a, a two-dimensional surface that has an entirely different shape to it, a, a different topology. This is kind of an abstract cutout figure, something that is faster and tastier, <laughs> uh, albeit maybe not so healthy, would be something like this, the, 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 the frosting or the icing that you get on an outside of a donut, and you can see that's got a, a particular type of, of structure to it, a particular type of hole in it. Uh, that's video games. Now there are other systems that would exhibit exactly the same underlying space as its structure if you had a, a system of independent mechanical arms executing rotation. That would give you exactly the same thing. Okay, so. We, uh, we have a few more dimensions yet to go because by the end of the talk, we're going to get to about 120. I think we're going to uh, just do one more and then skip ahead. Let's look for an example of an interesting three-dimensional space. Now, this is a challenge because, you know, we're kind of all used to the three-dimensional space that we know and love uh, here in this room. In order to help us visualize an interesting example of this, we're going to have to turn to uh, another ancient mathematician one of my favorites, who, of course, is not really a mathematician. It's, a, it's another poet. Anyone know who this is? Who is this? Oh, he's got the, he's got the, yeah, okay. This is Dante, this is Dante. This is a 14th century Italian poet who wrote what work? Help me out, guys. Right, Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso, put it together, what do you get? You get La Commedia, the Divina Commedia, the divine comedy. This, well, it's a long work. Let me give you a, a short synopsis 
in um, you know, sort of movie format. So it starts off as uh, something like an adventure movie. Dante, who wrote himself into the poem as a character, uh, meets up with a couple of monsters. Monsters chase him around. He asks for help. He runs into someone who's a ghost, who says he can help him. Dante says, oh, great, uh, what do we do? And this ghost, Virgil, another poet, says, follow me. Dante says, great, where are we going? Virgil says, well, we're going to hell. And he goes to hell. And he, you know, talks to a lot of people. There's a lot of talking, but there's also a lot of action. There's some monsters, there's some scary scenes. They almost make it out. And, uh, you know, kind of like a, a good video game, by the time you get to the end, you meet the big boss, you escape somehow, and then, uh, then you get out, and Dante and Virgil get out of hell. The movie then changes from an action flick to kind of a buddy movie. They, uh, they go mountain climbing, they see some sights, they talk to uh, yet more people, but then they get to the top, and then, then the movie changes entirely. Virgil goes away, and Dante meets someone. He meets a woman, her name is Beatrice. And this, again, is Dante writing his life into the story. Beatrice was a young woman whom Dante fell in love with when he was young. And he loved her from afar. And he loved her from an even farther distance when she died as a young woman. And he dedicated the rest of his life to writing a poet that would be worthy of her. And at the beginning of the Paradiso, Beatrice takes over as his guide, and it's a wonderful love story. It changes dramatically to a love story. Uh, Beatrice flies him up to the moon, uh, flies him to, uh, to Mercury, to Venus, to Jupiter. They go all the way out to the edge of the solar system beyond, and the movie ends with Dante seeing God and then going back to life. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Hmm. Uh, the way that Dante structured his universe is really interesting from a mathematical point of view. Now, uh, he, unlike Milton, could get away with putting hell under the earth. And the system of his cosmology that he used was, again, in accordance with the scientific consensus of the day. Namely, the earth is at the center, and it's surrounded by spheres that rotate. You have the sphere of the moon, the sphere of Mercury, Venus, da 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 Jupiter, Saturn all the way out to the sphere of fixed stars, and then beyond that, who knows? Well, that's what Dante explores. And in uh, chapter 28 of the Paradiso, uh, Dante is talking with Beatrice, and they've gone out to the edge of the solar system, and Dante is looking back down. He, he looks down, and he sees so far away the Earth, and the Earth surrounded by its concentric spheres rolling in their musical harmony. And uh, he sees the order in which they come. There's the moon close in, and then Mercury, and then Venus, and da-da-da-da, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And he, as he is looking down at the Earth through the solar system, uh, is looking at Beatrice's face, who is pointed in the opposite direction. And he sees something in her eye, uh, a glow, a bright spot. And inspired by that, he turns around, and he looks, and he sees this brilliant point of light out past the, the, the edge of the universe. And he sees this point of light surrounded by spheres that are rotating about it. But everything's all backwards. It's rotating the other way. He sees the same spheres that he saw before, but they're in the opposite order. He sees uh, Saturn close in, and then Jupiter farther out, and then Mars farther out from that. And he, uh, you know, he can't understand what he's seen. He says, what's going on? I, I turn around and I see this bright point and everything's rotating about this. Now, Beatrice gives an explanation. I'm not one to contradict Beatrice. But her explanation is uh, chiefly theological and uh, my thinking is a little bit more mathematical. Let's take a look at what Dante wrote from a, a mathematical point of view. And we're gonna see a really interesting three-dimensional space. Okay, so uh, the question is, you know, how could this possibly be? What does this mean? Let's look at a simpler example, a, a two-dimensional example, and see if we can crack this problem. Think of a uh, planet that is rotating about its axis. And look at all of the, the, the latitudinal lines. Look at all the equatorial lines striating it. If you were to stand at the south pole, at the bottom of the planet, 
you would think very rightly that the world rotates about you, that these equatorial lines are spinning and they grow out and out and out till you get to the equator and beyond and that everything is rotating about you. But as you traveled from there up to past the equator, you would see, oh, look at that. There's, a, there's another place far out that is fixed and that everything seems to be rotating about. And it's actually the, the same lines, the same equatorial lines, but just appearing in the opposite order from the perspective of the North Pole. So the way that Dante seems to have done it is not that he put uh, the Earth and man at the center of the universe, rather that he put it at the bottom of the universe. And he put the deity, the divine, up at the top. Now this is hard to visualize. Let me see if I can uh, do it for you in words and pictures. You need to uh, try to imagine a space where you have spheres surrounding a central point, these spheres growing and growing and growing until they seem to flip past an equator and become spheres that are concentric about another pole, a north pole, if you will. This is very difficult to visualize. It doesn't fit in this room. But that is the way that Dante structured his universe. And it is a topological space that is very familiar to mathematicians. We call that a three-dimensional sphere. It is the, uh, the boundary of a four-dimensional ball. And it is very, very common and very, very useful, although very difficult to visualize. It's wonderful to find it in a 600-year-old Italian poem. Okay, well, that's your, uh, that's your introduction to abstract topological spaces. The question is, uh, you know, I mean, where's the mathematics, right? There's, there's got to be some math in there somewhere. There's got to be some formulas. And indeed, there certainly are uh, lots of formulas. I'm not going to show them to you. I will tell you that we do spend about a year of graduate school teaching people how to do algebraic topology, and that the kinds of tools that we wind up using I'll go under the following names. You could, uh, you know, drop this at your next cocktail party. Impress your friends. One of the things that we use very commonly is something called homology. You might think of it as the study of holes. It has a, an algebraic dual, a, a mirror image to it called cohomology, which winds up uh, being very, very useful when paired back and forth. One of the simplest examples I can think of of thinking in a homological point of view would be something like the following. Let's say that uh, you're in a plane somewhere and you're surrounded by a fence, something like a maze, a simple closed curve is drawn and uh, you're trapped inside of it. The question is, is there a way to get out? Now, notice in this uh, picture that I've shown, I haven't even shown you where the exit to the maze is. Let's say you don't know that. Can you figure out whether it's possible to get out or not? There's a very, very simple way to do it, using just a tiny bit of homological thinking. And the idea is this. Just uh, shoot a ray, shoot a laser beam, and count how many times you cross the fence. If it's uh, an even number, then you can get out. If it's an odd number, you are trapped within. You're never going to get out. So counting. Uh, certain types of objects and doing just a little bit of algebra is going to answer that problem for you. This is an example of a, uh, a homological type of computation. And note that you don't need to know the structure of the entire fence. You don't need to know any equations for it. You just need to know very, very local bits of information. With a little bit of algebra, you could solve that problem. Now, that's just a, a very pale image of a, a much grander theory that. Uh, Thank me later, I won't give you all the details on <laughs> Now, of course, this begs the question, this may all be very beautiful, but, you know, what's it good for? Well, our last literary quote for the morning is coming from Solzhenitsyn. One of the characters in his book, The First Circle, says, topology may be in the 24th century. It might be useful for something. Now, Solzhenitsyn knew what he was saying because he was trained as a mathematician originally, and his advisor was a topologist. So he knows what he's talking about here. And indeed, this was the consensus point of view until maybe about uh, 10, 15 years ago, that topology, and especially algebraic topology, was so incredibly abstract to be uh, not only uh, unapplied, but inapplicable. 
well. This isn't the first time people have said that. When uh, calculus came out, it was the pinnacle of human thought. Isaac Newton invented some amazing stuff. And now, you know, we teach it to high school students. When linear algebra was first invented in the late 1800s, it was denounced as abstract nonsense, mostly by physicists. <laughs> and now they're better at linear algebra than most mathematicians. And again, we teach it to our undergraduates. The revolution that began in the Moore School at the University of Pennsylvania when we built ENIAC, that was a piece of work. That took a lot of effort, and it didn't do anything near what your cell phone does now. And if you think about it, the kind of exponential advance that we get in things like computation is due to uh, Moore's law, this principle that we're able to pack more and more semiconductors onto a sheet. Well, there is a Moore's law for more than semiconductors. There is a Moore's law for the mind. There is a Moore's law for mathematics. There is exponential increase in what mathematics is able to do and to accomplish. Much of it is extremely, extremely theoretical. But if we have good technology transfer from that pure mathematics to its applications, then we can harness the same type of energy that makes uh, our cell phones get better from year to year. And over the past decade, there's been a revolution in coming up with applications for these topological methods in everything from robotics to image processing to signal processing to data analysis. And let me end briefly by telling you a, a couple of things that my group has been working on over the past couple of years. We've done a lot of work with sensor networks, uh, sensors coming from eh, you know, everything from uh, <clears throat> video games, again, to uh, the kinds of sensors that we put on our robots in the GRASP laboratory at UPenn. Uh, one example of uh, these kinds of applications come from what you might call uh, coverage or communication problems, where you link a number of different sensors together. Uh, let's say that we look at, uh, oh, an ad hoc wireless network where perhaps all of the uh, cell phones that we're carrying around can, can talk to each other, but they can only talk within a limited range. You can set up a communications network. The question is, just having information about that network, not knowing anything about coordinates or equations or explicit geometry, can you say, uh, for example, if uh, we look at coverage regions associated to sensors, are there any gaps? Are there any holes? This might be important when our cell phones come equipped with, say, pathogen sensors or radiological sensors, and we might want to know, you know, is everything covered? Or in a um, time-dependent case, in a, you know, more security-type setting where sensors and everything else are in motion, we might want to know, is it possible for something or someone to avoid detection or not? That's really a question about holes, and that's really a question about the topology of the underlying system. We've been doing lots of work in network data integration and aggregation, where we can show how it is possible to solve problems with sensors that are so simple that you would think it's not possible to get that information out of such simple data as long as it's sufficiently networked and aggregated together. Uh, some of the work that we've, we've just had a breakthrough in the past couple of months on network data flow, looking at multi-commodity flows over networks with constraints that are both non-linear and non-convex. That is solving really difficult problems about what kinds of things can we push over networks. Uh, the last thing I'll tell you about is some uh, work we've done over the past year in signal processing where, uh, well, I think we have the only office in the uh, math department that has a soldering station. We we've built some simple acoustic cards that just send out little pings. And the question is, you know, how much can you infer about an environment from very, very low quality coarse data? Can you figure out just with a couple of pings, the, the rough shape of this room. How many pillars are there in the back? Uh, is there a ceiling fan uh, that is on? If so, in what direction is it moving? Another project that we did this past summer with uh, graduate students at a educational workshop was to have everyone walk around a complicated building with a laptop or a cell phone that has wireless capability and just dump data about uh, the, the SSIDs, the wireless networks that you can access keeping track of the 
the SSID numbers, and then the signal strength. And that data winds up getting, uh, you know, into a space of dimension about 120. We use some topological methods to map that data out, and we get, without any GPS, without any coordinates, without any uh, real hard work, a fairly accurate map of the building with uh, the presence of an atrium, with the presence of this branch off here. Those kinds of projects harnessing some very, very abstract tools. And what I want to end with is just the notion that mathematics is so much of the fuel on which many of the interesting research projects at Penn run. It's a key to innovation. Thanks very much for your attention.